Do we have the courage of our forefathers? Busi Tembekwayo is a South African venture capitalist, entrepreneur, and founding CEO of My Good Phone. At 25 years, Busi runs his 400 million rand division in a renowned multinational and one of the youngest directors on a listed company in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. His mentorship programs discover and nurtures high good black entrepreneurs through funding and enterprise development. Busi has been a catalyst for change in business across the globe through high expertise and strategic leadership and organizational culture to organizations such as Medcash. Watch and be motivated for Africa is rising. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It's become tradition for me. If you're not a believer, you may excuse yourself. But to those of us that are, can I ask that we stand and pray? If we can all close our eyes. Father God, as we discuss, flex, move, and extend our minds, we ask that you are present in this room and that you embed within us not only the wisdom of these conversations, but the discernment of this moment, the critical nature of what it is we are discussing here. Most importantly, Father God, the fortitude to take forward with your grace and your will. For it is written, Father God, that it is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. And so through your Lord, Spirit, Lord Jesus, we ask that we engage here to this morning. And let the church say, amen. amen and amen. Everybody have a seat. Everybody have a seat. To my good brother, Pastor Podru, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here again. Every time we are together, I feel underdressed. <laughs> I, and I, I do the best I can to, to, to bring it. The last time my brother Pudju and I were together, I was in a suit and, and he was in a kaftan, so I thought I would switch it up this time and, and now he's gone the other way. He, he's a sellout, he's a sellout. Um, to my incredible sister, uh, Jumoke, I absolutely loved your presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Can we give her a round of applause? Thank you so much. I, I must confess that I, I was intrepid to come back, um, and I'll, I'll confess why. As a professional public speaker, one of the things you learn is that it's easy to impress an audience for the first time and only one time. It's incredibly difficult to do it the second time round. So we're all going to pretend that we're already impressed and that you're, you're all going to find value in what it is. I wanted to say, given the limitation of our time, I thought about what it is I would come and share here today. I thought about the conversations we'd been having, the theme for this gathering, and what I could bring to this conversation that would not only elevate the conversation, but more importantly, leave us in the room, all of us, with some nuggets, some takeaways, some things we can do every day visibly to try and make our lives better. This is, uh, must be my seventh or eighth time in your beautiful country. I still cannot get over the culture shock. I, I don't know how you do it. Uh, I'm struggling. And in part, it's because, because of where I come from, and for those of you who've never traveled to South Africa, when you do, you realize as a South African going into the rest of the continent, that we are often disconnected from the realities of what it takes to truly live, exist, and thrive in our continent. Some of those realities borne by unfortunate circumstance, by poor policy decisions and poor leadership, by others born by just the nature of the global strata, the way of our global economics, the wave of the various methodologies and philosophies, and often, if not most of the time, 
sometimes even the interference of the large hand from other parts of the world. And so, it's not uncommon to find, as Africans who are capable and dexterous, who are talented and educated, to move to parts of the world where our talent can truly be extracted, exploited, for us to do better for our own selves in our own generation. But I would like to think that there is a different question for our generation here today. And the question is this. Do we have the courage of our forefathers? I think that's the fundamental question. I was sat in conversation about a week ago with a, a young lady that I mentor, and she's begun to get some acclaim. She runs a business, and she's doing exceptionally well. And she's beginning, Pastor Fordu, to get some acclaim. She's being recognized by people. She's being invited to do interviews. And one of the things that's happening as she's getting the acclaim is she's also getting the criticism. Now, there is no preparatory school for how to deal with criticism. There just isn't. And so often what happens is as you rise to the natural place to which you have been called, as the fire of criticism descends upon you, if you, like me, have any semblance of self-introspection, often you believe that the criticism must be true, must be valid, must be, must be well-placed, and then, therefore, you internalize that and you dim your light. Imagine the cowards we must be to be born of forefathers who liberated our continent from colonizers only for you and I to be broken down by a tweet. And so the question, I think, for our moment and for our season today is do you have the courage to rise above a hashtag? Will your life be nothing more than a demonstration of somebody else's opinion of you? Now, what is interesting is this. Notice the means of the enemy, when he is well aware that you are on the path to your greatness, he makes the noise to distract you. I had a conversation with a brother in Christ of mine, Grace, and I was sharing this with him, and he said, you know, Vusi, it's something very interesting, but if you are a, a runner, an athlete, a marathon runner, say, and you're running on the track, and you're doing a 3,000 meter, eight laps around a 400 meter track, he says, do you know what happens? I said, what? He said, each and every single one of the people in the grandstands has something to say every time you come around the grandstands. He says, but of course they have the breath to say something. They're not using their breath to physically exert themselves to achieve things. And so for those of us then who are quiet in the season, we are quiet because we are sparing our energy for the things for which our energy is called. We just don't have the time to do the things that don't matter. I think we're called on in this season as young Africans to seize power, to truly seize it. In the words of Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without demand. And so therefore, if we want a better life for ourselves, we must demand of that power. I often hear young people today, last night I was invited by a friend of mine who is from Ghana and he's in South Africa as well, so we went out for some dinner, spent some time with some young people. And I often hear young people today say things like this, you know, it's time for young people to rise. It's time for the old people to move out of the way. It's time, it's time, it's time. Let me tell you, young people, there is no old person going anywhere. If you want that seat in that office, in that boardroom, in that chamber, in that ministry, you're going to have to fight for it because power isn't given, it's taken. And so the question as our continent rises is, will we be men and women of courage? Will we be the generation in 50 years' time that our children reference and say, they, they did it right? They had the template for how to truly pull out of each other the ability to work with each other. And something fascinating is happening today. I must tell you this. This is the good news. The good news is that we're no longer separated. The good news is that we find each other. 
The good news is that in this room, there are people who are following Vusi Tembegwayo on Instagram. I, I know I'm very good looking on Instagram, I must tell you. I must tell you, I am very good looking on Instagram. But the good news is that even I have the privilege of following a Professor Lumumba's work. No matter where in the world I find myself, where there are Africans who are speaking, leading, evangelizing, and growing others, we now have the ability to find each other. The true question is, will we have the ability to build with each other? You see, to date, our building strategies all center on these borders that were drawn for us and not by us. And so it becomes the question of, is your nation thriving versus mine? I had this conversation with a friend of mine who also works in capital markets like me in South Africa. I said, I'm really confused by this feud we have with Nigeria. I genuinely don't understand it. Why do we constantly migrate to the global north and South Africa tries to posture against Nigeria and Nigeria against South Africans? Who, what's the game here? What's the gambit? Whom is it that we're trying to please and against whom are we trying to please them? Because each time we find our leaders playing that game, the question perhaps we should ask is who is the master you're trying to please? In this moment and in this season, I think as a generation, we are called to truly understand what it's going to take, one and all, to work with each other, but to build with each other. This is, I think, the generational mission of the platform. I said this to my brother, Pastor Pojo, the last time, and I will say it now here publicly, that what has started as the platform Nigeria, in my mind, needs to be the platform Africa. It needs to bring together leaders in various spheres and various spaces who are at the frontier of what it's going to take to truly take our continent to next, whatever next might be, and have them in a single platform sharing ideas about what next looks like. In my world, I spend an awful lot of time looking for investment arbitrage an awful lot of time looking for the ability to buy X and sell at Y in a particular time period and make sure that my risk, what we would call in finance your risk adjusted for the cost of taking that risk, makes sure that you earn a return that is commensurate to what the investors are looking for. And often one of the things we do as investment professionals is where we might lack the opportunity to find a true and meaningful arbitrage is we will invent it just by purely looking at the various countries and citizens and the natures of those countries and where there might be an underweighting one asset class of another. That is to say, rather than meaningfully creating and adding value, we're skimming off the top of the cappuccino and milking the froth. And every time you do, the investors are simply asking the question, is there froth, rather than, have you made a fresh cup of cappuccino? So in this moment then, and in this season, it's important that we unite, that we truly pull each other towards each other. I will say it here. I will unite with any man and woman to do right, I will unite with nobody to do wrong. Amongst our greatest naiveties, I think, is that we presuppose that in the world of good and evil, it exists a little bit like it does in the superhero movies. It's how we approach the world. There's a bad scenario and superhero flies in and saves things. And then, forever and a day, things will be better after that. Reality does not mirror that expectation. In reality, most people are complex. Most societies are complex. The challenge for us is whether or not we, individually, can be a force for good, a true force for greatness. When I was prepping for this, uh, Pastor Pojo, I did something interesting. I'm an analytical mind. I work in the world of finance. So in my world, if you want to prove something, you put it in a spreadsheet. And if it's in a spreadsheet, you can put it on a graph. And if it's on a graph, it must be true. <laughs> Nobody debates a graph. 
So in preparation for this, I arced my mind back and I looked at 10 of Africa's largest economies between the years 1956 and 1968. And I looked at what it was that made up those economies. I looked in that particular period because that was the transitory period in our continent. What I wanted to seek and find was to answer a simple question. What does it take for Africans to be great? It's a simple question. Now, because of the nature of my work, I went and looked for the actual thing that I could prove here, the scientific thing that I could go statistically, if you do these things on a balance of probabilities, you will achieve whatever greatness is defined as for you. And here is what I found. I found that in every instance where there was a particular set of factors that made a population group or a citizenry or a nation achieve its goals, if you took those very same factors and plugged them into a different citizenry, the numbers would not tally. That is to say the following, that beyond strategy, beyond information, beyond policy, formations and conversations, all of which, by the way, are fundamental. There is a single truism that holds, an ingredient without which the coffee doesn't taste good, and the ingredient is this, choice. Do the people of those countries choose to be great? You know this is true, by the way, because there are a lot of choices we make as people that filter into just how we think about ourselves. When you say or hear people say things like, this is just how we do things in Nigeria. That kind of statement is often diminutive. It reduces us to the basic bare minimum and says accept this because this is the standard. In other words, even though we could choose better, we choose what we just get. That greatness is truly a choice. If greatness is a choice, Last time, Pastor Pojo shouted at me for not having a presentation. I've got one today. <laughs> there are three things then that I think we should all consider in this moment and in this season. The first, I think the era of demographics is dead. I think the era of framing ourselves by the tribe we come from, the background we come from, the place we went to, or how we were raised is moved. I think what we've become today is not just a demographic people. What we have become today is a psychographic people. We are connected in the way we think about the world, not just the way we exist in the world. And so today we find more commonality with each other because psychographically we see the world in similar ways. We aspire for similar. In other words, we are more alike than we think. If, therefore, we are truly to rise as a continent, then how we leverage this as a choice is going to be important. Side note. One of the things I think that's missing in this season, it's my own humble opinion, that is to say I'm might very well be incorrect, although I doubt it. One of the things in my mind that's missing in this season is a patriotic, flag-bearing, strong group, not only of men and women, but of Nigerians, who understand in the African context what Nigeria is. With the greatest of respect, I think in large part, the average is so distracted by internally what's going on, you're missing who you are in the global context of your continent. You're too worried about what's being said, or who's japaying, or who won the elections, or what's next, without thinking consciously about what you could do as an economy. If Nigeria decided, we're going to set the path for the rest of the region. As a consequence of this, absent of leadership, what happens? Everything that we have been seeing. And so the question for this moment, for each and every single one of us, is will we be the courageous men and women 
who recognize the season we are in. I'm not sure how many of us have traveled to my country of South Africa. Any of you here? Hands up. When you do, and I hope for all of you that you do, which, by the way, side note, a conversation we must have, and uh, Brother Pojo, I don't know how we do this. We need to convene the leaders of this continent to talk about this visa story. This is a disaster. And, and let me just say the following. Let me just say the following. I, 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 can't, I struggle to understand why I can land in Paris, get on a train, and end up in Brussels. But if I want to move from Joburg to Khaboroni, I must produce a passport. Who's the genius that came up with the scheme? You know, the Europeans are so quick to tell us that we can't bundle ourselves into a single block, but they've done it. When you publish this, you must just leave that part out because, <laughs> because I'm busy raising money from them, you know, I don't know. They're going to say, he's too radical. <laughs> and so, even in my own native land of South Africa, the work as South Africans we must do is to conscientize each other about the continent. In my mind, and I was listening to your comments, ma'am, about the youth service, I'm, I'm seized to understand and failing to understand why we are not deliberately sending young people into other parts of the continent. Experience the culture, live with the people. <laughs> to come here, to be here in this beautiful country, I had to go through Ethiopia. From Ethiopia, I was in Zambia. So, so I went South Africa, Zambia, Ethiopia, Nigeria. Between now and December, I'm going to be in about eight different African countries. In that same time, it's going to be easier for me to do five different countries in Europe than it will be to do two different countries in Africa. Less layovers, less time. I'm sorry, can, can we just pause? Just one moment, pause the time. Who designed this nonsense? <laughs> Who wrote the script? I have a theory. And here is my theory. You only lock the vault where there is money. And so maybe there's a reason you've been kept out of that neighboring country. Maybe there's a reason you've been kept out of that neighboring region. Maybe there's a reason you can't travel to that other place. Because if you were to, there is something you might do that would help us build what we all know we are capable of. So first, keep them away from each other. Second, convince them that they're enemies with each other. And third, convince them that the other one is better than the other one. And before you're done, they will hate each other so much you don't even need to pass policy or law. And in the middle of all of this, here we sit as young people, fruitfully connected by the H -H HTTPS, and we're more worried about what's trending and commenting on it, rather than how do we meaningfully build with each other and do business. I came to tell you here today that I'm only interested in meaningfully building and doing business. I'm only interested in understanding how do we take the platform and put it in Johannesburg or put it in Cape Town. And how do we have not just this conversation here, but that conversation there? Because until and when Africa truly is of a single mind, it will continue to be the fodder and the meal for the rest of the global average. I don't know about you, but I would like a world slightly different for my children than the one I grew up in. So we must recognize then that our value to the world is cemented. And recognize beyond that, that even that very idea of what it is that is our value is changing. There are five fundamental ways value is changing.
I'm going to spend a minute on them. The first is value is changing around how we think of our identity as Africans. The second, how we think around what is truly wealth as Africans. The third, how we think around what we're building as the next generational legacy as Africans. The fourth, this archetype of these binary ideas we've always had, they and us, recognizing that we operate as a single block and in unison. If we don't understand and leverage each of these value constructs, we are missing the fundamental layer that is layered into our society today. Just our identity alone. You know, 20 years I've been a speaker now, 19 this year. I became a professional speaker at the age of 19 years old. I'm 38 now. For half my life, I've had the incredible grace, by God's grace, of standing on platforms such as this and looking into eyes like yours. There is no part of my story that should bring me here. I don't come from a family of orators. I don't come from a family of means. I don't come from a family of wealth. One of the challenges we've struggled with in South Africa post-apartheid has been crime. I know this because my father was murdered when I was 13 years old. Eight times my father was shot for a cell phone. To this day, twice the case has been opened, both times the docket has been lost. Far be it for me as a proud South African to travel the rest of my continent and speak poorly about my country, but what it is I am trying to help you understand is there is no part written into my past that makes my present possible. And so it is not only then, but by the grace of God, but more importantly, because I was able to meet that grace with work and opportunity. That most of us in this room are simply denied that work and that opportunity. What could we do when we truly come together as a single block? A week ago, I was in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. Today, I'm here. I make it my intention to travel the continent. Because, and on this point, I will end with this. You see, it's easy for a politician to lie to you about Pan-Africanism when you've never traveled Africa. They can tell you their version of it because they've never been there. They will tell you how Africans speak even though they've never been there. Which, side note, why do Nigerians add all to everything? I'm sat at dinner last night, and this young man I'm with said something so profound. I was like, wow, that's so good. He said, please don't take my words off. <laughs> and the final way value is changing is that value has introduced us to this idea of free. That we can connect with each other freely. Share with each other freely. But most importantly, build each other freely. I recognize, as a South African who loves his country, that the rise of Nigeria to being the number one largest economy in the continent is not a threat to mine. It's the rising tides that elevate all ships. So then, what do we do? What is next? Where do we go from here? There are three things I'd like to leave you with. And I will preface those three things by saying this. Constantly question what you're seeing. Constantly question what it is that you're seeing. Hmm. I'm fascinated when I watch the news about how Africa... Is, is betrayed, the story of who we are. It fascinates me. Because that story and that messaging is used intentionally to wire us to see each other a certain way. I 
When I was in Kenya last week, I must tell you, one of my dreams came true. I was in Kenya invited by uh, a mutual brother in Christ between myself and Pastor Poju, uh, Re Reverend Julian. And, and uh, Rev. Julian had uh, our brother Apostle Salman in the room. And, and so he doesn't know that I'm a big fan. And so he came in and said, ah, I've seen you online. I said, yeah, I've also seen you online. <laughs> Pastor Poju, there's something I feel in my heart I must say to you, which is this. I think a Lord, our Lord and Savior has called upon you as a merchant of the kingdom to build his kingdom. And I think in this moment, the way you have built this platform is amongst the ways our Lord and Savior is using you to evangelize not only the gospel, but more importantly, to let those of us who can evangelize, evangelize the same. And so it's not just a platform you see of conversation, but it is a platform that launches a generation. It's a platform to next. Please question what it is that you're seeing. There are four fundamental perspectives you must always question. The first is the perspective of hindsight. Notice how many times when you're in discussions, conversations, meetings, people talk about the past. Now, the past is important because it frames how we find ourselves in this moment. But what's even more important than this is to ensure that we never allow the past to keep us there. The second perspective is plain sight. Plain sight. What is barely in front of you, you see it as it appears. Question that too, because often, as the old Gaelic expression says, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. The third perspective is insight. Seeing what we've seen from the past, observing what we observe in the current day, what does it mean about where we are and where we find ourselves now? And the fourth and final perspective, which I think is going to be the challenge of our generation, is foresight. Let's talk about tomorrow. Let's talk about 2027. I would love to have a conversation about what does education in 2027 look like in Nigeria? What does it look like in South Africa? So that we stop, as Africans, producing little laborers that we export to the global north. And rather than say, we're all going to produce the same skills, ask of ourselves the question, what are the skill sets that your economy and your people might produce to which we could be a complement and vice versa? You see, the reason we're fighting with each other is because we're trained in the same way to fight for limited opportunities, all of us in the same environment. It's not until we build with each other that we recognize the opportunity. In venture capital, we do this well. If you're outsourcing tech talent today in Africa, you're outsourcing it typically to a Nigerian outfit. No, no, where in the continent you find yourself. If you're looking for somebody who's worked in fintech somewhere in Africa, typically you'll find them in East Africa. If you're looking for somebody who's smart, 6'2", Zulu, well-spoken, ladies love him, I mean. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't personally know anyone, I'm just saying. I begin with a quote, I will end with one. The greatest orator of all time, in my opinion, is Frederick Douglass. One of his greatest quotes, he says, it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair weak men. We need to build strong children. We need to truly protect our futures by giving them the right set of values for the world we are in today. And all of us, no matter where we find ourselves, in whatever crevice or corner to which you have been called, to do the work that's required to preserve for the next generation. 
I'm humbled, my brother, that you've invited me back here. I, words cannot express what it means for me to be back here with you. Uh, last time I made a commitment which I didn't honor, I will honor it this time, which is that the next time we are together, I'm paying for coffee. <laughs> They're not paying me to say this, so let me tell you this. You know, the reason most Africans look at Nigerians the way we look at you is because, frankly, we're just scared. <laughs> you guys are loud. <laughs> and you're big, and you like to fight, and we don't know why. <laughs> the number of years has been coming, I must tell you, has mentored and taught me. It's matured me. Even the way I approach business, the way I negotiate now, Sometimes I find myself in the boardroom and I think to myself, switch to Nigerian Vusio. <laughs> Do the aggressive Nigerian thing. Fight, argue, raise your voice. And it works. <laughs> and so on behalf of me, my firm, and the taxes I have not paid for what you have taught me here, Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here once again. Thank you. Who created this thing called borders in Africa? Where we cannot find our fellow Africans from the Zululand in South Africa. Visit their fellow brothers and sisters in the Yoruba land in Nigeria and the Buru people in Cameroon, linking with the Ashanti tribe in Ghana. Bond together, understand each other's culture, and trade to build the Africa that we all dream of. Thank you for watching. Africa is rising.